The integumentary system is the skin, okay? It, the, it is the skin and all of the glands that are structures that are associated with the skin, okay? So the skin is the main organ. It is, the integument is equal to the skin. It is your cutaneous membrane. That's the outside. That's a bar our barrier to the outside world, helps keep uh, things out and important things in, right? We keep water, fatty acids, uh, temperature in, right? As, and then we also use that to help regulate our body temperature, keep harmful materials out, and also get rid of some other things that are there, okay? It is used as a visual indicator of our physiology and our health, okay? We've all seen the little, uh, the little icon. That's this guy, right? Our little emoji. Our little throw up emoji, right? Why is it green? Why is it green? Well, what do you say when someone looks green? They have a greenish skin. How do you look when you feel like you're gonna puke? You get that oh, pale-like look, and it looks like you turn green. That's why it's there, okay? So it's a visual indicator of our health. Sometimes you get white, you get pale, what we call pallor, and you know, you, that's because sometimes you get really warm, right? You have a fever, what does your face look like? It's red. It's red, <coughs> it's red. why? Well, what is fever? How do you know you have a fever? Your body, goes up. your body temperature goes up. And your cheeks get flushed and red because your internal body temperature is up and you are trying to regulate it. And more blood vessels at the, at the surface makes it red in hopes, in hopes of dissipating the heat to the environment. Okay? So a great visual indicator of our physiology and our health just by looking. And dermatology. Dermatology is the study of the skin. All right, so dermatologists are anyone who, who's fans of this. Um, she's a dermatologist. Anyone ever see that show? Yeah. Dr. Pibble Popper? Man. I, you know, my wife only like, can stand for about five minutes of it. She's like, I'm done. It's so gross. I'm like, this is cool. That is like a, it's a six pound zit guy has on his back or something like that. It's a cyst. It's so cool. And she's like, it's so gross. I'm going to throw up. Okay. So, dermatology. All right. So let's talk about the integument. All right. It is the body's largest organ. It weighs roughly 8 to 10 pounds. Uh, maybe, maybe 12, depending upon size. Okay. Um, the good thing about it and why we do it now, why we study, I think, in the terms of, in the sequence of anatomy and physiology, is that it's a great lead-in when we go from histology to the integument because it has all of the tissues that are present in the body in one organ, okay? You'll find epithelial tissue, you'll have, find connective tissue, you'll find muscle, you'll find nerves, all within the one area, okay? When we talk about skeletal system, it is, there's, there, there's nerves and epithelial tissue there, but we're really concerned about the bone, et cetera. All right, so it's a little bit sep separate. But we allow this together, um, and it, it's a good, it's a good uh, segue, okay? The surface of the cutaneous membrane is composed of epithelial tissue. Specifically, right, this is what type of epithelium? Do you remember? Stratified squamous, right? The outside, though, we said there was, when we talked about this, we said there was two types of stratified squamous epithelial tissue that we will run into. We talked about, what are they? Keratinized and non-keratinized. And, non and which one is the skin? Is keratinized, all right? So we're going to make sure we're going to write that down. Keratinized means that the, out, the cells along the outside surface are dead. Dead cells on the outside 
that are filled with the protein keratin. Okay? Underneath the epithelium, we have an underlying connective tissue, provides strength and resistance. That's the dermis, and it's made up of mostly um, dense, irregular connective tissue. Okay? And there's also some smooth muscle that's associated with the hair follicles. So there's where our muscle comes in. And then nervous tissue. We have se sensors and nerve receptors for touch, different pressure, temperature, pain. Okay? All within the skin. The overall function of the skin is to protect body organs, right? Internal. It protect, protects the underlying tissue. When you lose that under, or you somehow break it, exposes the tissue to the outside, you, rele you remove that type of protection. Overall, it is about 7%, 7 to 8% of your body weight, all right? And the thickness depends upon body location. We have two different types of skin. We have thick skin and we have thin skin. Where will you find thick skin? In what two places? Palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Okay? There's my hand and foot drawings. Try to keep it an artist's major, an art major I was not. Okay? Thick skin, palms of the hands, soles of the feet. Okay? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, let's talk about the two layers of the skin. Now this is, you all went over this, should have gone over this in lab last week. Or two weeks ago, yes? Mm -hmm. Right, alright, so a lot of this right here is, is review. Alright, so we have the epidermis, which is the outer stratified squamous epithelium. Alright, that's the, the keratinized stuff. And then underneath that, we have the deeper layer, which is the dermis, all right, which is primarily irregular, dense, connective tissue. Okay, and then underneath the dermis is the subcutaneous layer, which is technically not part of the skin, okay? Technically not part of the integumentary system is the hypodermis. The hypodermis is composed of alveolar connective tissue and also adipose tissue, right? Adipose, a subcutaneous layer of fat, okay? So when I ask you what the to identify the layers of the skin, the correct answer would not include the hypodermis. It would include the epidermis. It would include the dermis. Okay? But not the hypo hypodermis. It is not technically a layer of skin. All right, so here's a picture. gives you all your different structures. Right? The integument includes the epidermis and the dermis. The subcutaneous layer beneath the dermis. Okay? Um, the epidermis, multiple layers of... Uh, stratified squamous epithelial tissue. With these are the, out here are the dead cells, and then you end up in here, end up with the live cells, and then the basal layer, the deepest layer of the, of the cells, which I'm going to outline here, down here, a little bit thicker than that. Let's go this one. Right, down here, this layer, uh, that's the basal layer. That those are the cells that are are living and undergoing mitosis. Okay, they are undergoing mitosis and then feeding into the the, la the layers of cells above it. Okay. All of these layers in purple in the epidermis up here are living. This layer right here kind of separates the living cells from the dead cells, right? They start to die off and they're out there, okay? So we have the dermis down here. The dermis is actually two distinct layers, <clears throat> all right? We have this upper portion, which includes, let's erase this right here, all right? Includes the wave that you see 
of the epidermis, right? This wave right there. See that kind of curly um, layer of the epidermis? That is the papillary layer. So the papillary layer of, of the dermis is like this. It includes that wave, right? Each of, the, each of the waves is called a dermal papilla, right? And allows for extension of the dermis into the epidermis. It is what gives you those little waves of your fingerprints, okay? Or the waves in your skin when you look. That is the dermal papilla. In some places, it's more defined, like in the finger, like in the fingers and the soles of the feet, you have those fingerprints, right? Where you don't really see that too much in, say, on your arm or something like that. Okay, that's about 20% of the total of the dermis is the dermal papilla, and the other 80% is the reticular layer, the reticular layer, deeper layer of the dermis. <clears throat> there are a number of organs or, or um, <clears throat> structures that are associated with the dermis and the skin, okay? You have hair follicles. So here's a big hair follicle, right? This is the shaft of the hair comes down into the hair bulb, and that's where each little hair has a little blood vessel that helps support it. Okay? Every hair on your body is associated with a muscle. This muscle is an erector pili muscle. Okay? It is the muscle that contracts and stands the hair up straight, right, when you get goosebumps. <clears throat> Every hair follicle has one. It also has this little gland here that's associated with the hair follicle called the sebaceous gland. It's an oil gland that releases a, a uh, secretion called sebum onto the hair follicle, which then extends out and starts to lubricate the skin around it, all right? Sebum has some antibacterial uh, function, helps maintain the skin's lubrication and kind of its softness, and also fights off some bacteria that are, lay, uh, that are residing on the dead layers of cells, <clears throat> okay? All, squid, all skin also has, oh, uh, let's do it in a different color. A sweat gland, this is a sweat gland, and you see it, the pore comes out and ends on the surface of the skin, okay? This is American sweat, sweat gland, all right? So it's a, or American sweat gland. So it's a sweat gland. We'll talk about the two types of sweat glands in a little bit, <clears throat> all right? So then the other thing that, the other important part of structures of the skin are the receptors, the sensory receptors. Okay, we have a few of them that are important. Okay, we have one here, <coughs> right? That's a tactile receptor, right? It's up in the dermal papilla so that you can touch. It allows for um, sensation of gentle or like uh, more fine touch feeling hairs on a, on a paintbrush, or, or feeling hairs on your skin, a gentle touch on the top, on the, on the surface of the skin that you can feel, right? That is a tactile or a, what we call, a Meisner's corpuscle. Okay, that's the tactile. All right? <clears throat> the other one that's important, there's two others, so we had number two right there. That's the one that's, we have one that's up in the dermal papilla. Number two, that's a Ruffini's. The R-U-F-I-N-I-S. A Ruffini's corpuscle. And then we have one that's deep, that's number three. Okay, number three, that is a Pacinian corpuscle. The Pacinian detects deeper touch, okay? All right. So you're going to save someone from falling off the cliff at Sleeping Giant. Are you going to touch them gently or are you going to grab their hand and hold on? 
That's a different type of pressure, right? The Pacinian detects that deeper pressure. Where is it located? Deeper in the dermis. So it detects that deeper pressure. Okay? And then the last part of this is the blood vessels that are present in the skin. Where do you find the blood vessels in the skin? In what layer? In the dermis. Where do you not find blood vessels in the skin? In what layer? In the epidermis, right? Epidermis is an epithelial tissue. It is avascular. Okay, there are some free nerve endings that you will find in the epidermis as well, all right? But you do not have blood vessels, yes? It, 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 a, a paper cut will at least go into and go through and break the blood vessels that are in the, say, the dermal papillae, right? So they'll get, the paper cut will get down to about there, okay? When you get a deeper cut, it'll get down to something like that, and you, it bleeds a lot more. I don't want to say really thin, but they are, it's multiple layers of... <coughs> of a lot of cells that are, that are really squished together. So its thinness relative to the dermis is, is much less. Okay, other questions? All right, so the epidermis, right? We said it was keratinized, stratified, squamous epithelial tissue. You have specific layers, what we call strata, strata, stratosphere, from deep to superficial. Right, so stratum basal, that's the deepest. This is the one that undergoes mitosis, right? It is right next to the dermis, right? It's that kind of wave. So, right, and then you have purple cells up there, and then you might have some yellow cells up here, okay? But the stratum basal is this wave, right? That the wave of cells that you'll see under the microscope, right? That's the stratum basal, right? So that cells undergo mitosis and then they start to migrate to the superficial layer. So the stratum basal is the deepest layer, then spinosum, the cells start to change kind of shape a little bit. They start to have kind of these little spines, right? And then they get to this granulosum stage, meaning that they have little granules inside. And then lucidum is the one that may or may not be there, okay? Stratum lucidum is not present in thin skin. Only thick. So thick skin will have five layers of the epidermis, while thin skin will only have four. Then the last one, which is the most, the most layers of, the, of cells, it's like maybe 10 to 15 layers of dead cells, is stratum corneum, right? The cornified, keratinized layer. Right? The first three layers are living keratinocytes. Keratinocytes are just a name for cells that are going to produce keratin. Right? But the outer layers are composed of dead cells. Okay? Questions on the number of layers? So this goes through them. Sometimes uh, stratum basal is also known as stratum germinavidum or the Basal layer, germinavidum is referred to the germinating layer, the one that's growing, all right? It's a single layer of cuboidal to columnar cells, and it's attached to the basement membrane, just like all epithelial tissue. You will have three types of cells there. Keratinocytes are the ones that are part of the squamous epithelium. Melanocytes, they are, they pr produce melanin. That's for your skin's tone skin color, okay, and then you have tactile cells, important for touch as well, but those are uh, the main types of cells. 
Okay, keratinocytes, they're most abundant. They're found in all layers, all right? At stratum basal, they are considered stem cells. They are going to grow. They're not pluripotent stem cells. They're just going to continue to grow and produce more cells for the upper layers, for the more, more superficial layers. All right, so they'll start replenishing cells, all right? They are, keratinocytes are named because they synthesize keratin. It is the protein that strengthens the epidermis. All right? And it makes skin almost waterproof so that no water get, excess water gets in or, ex, or really it's meant for keeping water in your body, not necessarily water out. Okay? It's really meant for you to retain water so we don't get dehydrated. That's a problem. Melanocytes, they are scattered among the keratinocytes and they produce melanin, all right, in response to ultraviolet light. So we go outside, um, we lay in the sun, your you know, sun is UV light, you are stimulating your cells, to, your melanocytes to produce more melanin. <coughs> we do this over the summer, we get a tan, okay? It transfers the pigment granules to other cells into the keratinocytes and that's where it stays, right? It, it, it accumulates, the pigment actually accumulates around the nucleus. It's almost like a shade for your, your nucleus of the cell because UV light causes damage to DNA. And where is the DNA stored in the cell? In the nucleus. So by accumulating around the nucleus, we're protecting the DNA from, from damage, all right? And different types, melanin, um, we all produce melanin. We, uh, they come in different shades, whether it's kind of yellow to, to light brown to kind of a, a darker brown. The different shade melanin produced and the different amount that's produced leads to our, the differences in skin tone. Okay, and that's a genetic basis for that. All right, tactile cells within the epidermis or within the stratum basal are called Merkel cells. They are not very abundant. They are sensitive to touch and they release chemicals. For those of you who are feverishly writing on, on your uh, notebook, th this lecture is posted on Blackboard. It is 9.5, part two, okay? So you have it, so I, I don't want you guys to not think you don't have it or, okay? Okay. Stratum spinosum, there's also known as a spiny layer. There's a little bit of a spiny appearance to the cells under microscopy, right? So the cells under the stratum basal, they divide and one of the cells stays in the stratum basal, right, as a stem cell. The other cell gets pushed to the next level and starts to become the, one of the spiny cells, right? So that's why daughter, the daughter cells from stratum basal are pushed into this layer. And then they begin to, they stop dividing and they begin to come, differentiate into keratinocytes, okay? These are attached by intercellular junctions called desmosomes. Right, so there's, they're all connected together so that you don't just lose a layer of skin really easily. Right, we want to keep them together, one continuous barrier, one continuous organ. Within the stratum spinosum, you also have the epidermal dendritic cells, what we call Langerhan cells. It's a fourth cell type. Right, this helps to initiate an immune response. They are kind of sporadic throughout the epidermis, um, but they respond to pathogens, right? So they are right on the barrier of your body. So if anything gets in, hopefully they, they respond right away. You have bacteria that live on your skin, okay? You have resident bacteria on, that live on the skin. Staph aureus lives on your skin, okay? If it gets in, 
it will and it can and will cause an infection. Okay? Um, it happens all too often. Has anyone ever had cellulitis? Okay, so like, <clears throat> I don't know, like four years ago? Four years ago, I was teaching this, and um, my daughter was out uh, practicing softball like she does all the time, and I noticed like we go out one day, and we're, she's pitching and whatever, we played and we, the, we, we're done. The next day, I go to work, and I notice my elbow's kind of like red and warm to the touch, and it's kind of just, I can feel it, it's a little swollen. Go through the day, no big deal. Next day, it's a little bit more swollen, a little bit more red. I'm like, it doesn't hurt. I don't think I hurt it when I was throwing. What's going on? Um, I waited a third day, and then all of a sudden, I, it got to be like a little bit of a, I'd say, like tennis ball size, swollen. I'm like, all right, so I got to go to the doctor. So I go to the doctor, and she's, the nurse is like, you have cellulitis. I'm like, okay, whatever that is. So the doctor says, yeah, yeah, you need an antibiotic. It's just a bacterial infection that happens. You get, usually it's a bacteria that is normally on the skin, but gets in, not a problem. Okay, fine. But have you all heard of MRSA? Yes? Methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Staph aureus is a normal bacteria that lives on your skin. But the problem with that is sometimes that bacteria becomes resistant to the normal antibiotics that are used for it. So I get an antibiotic, and the doctor takes it. He's like, all right, we're going to outline this with a little uh, marker. We'll make sure it goes down in a couple days and go from there. Okay, fine. So I marker, okay, and I check it. Take the antibiotic. And First day, it started going away. I was like, all right, working, this is good, easy. Second day on the antibiotics, and in the morning, I was like, oh, it's a little red again, I don't know. But that was about nine o'clock. By the time I was driving home at three, that infection, was, which was around my elbow, had spread and now was red down to my wrist. I immediately drove to the emergency room. Because what, what does that tell you? I'm taking antibiotics, but the in infection is spreading. What's happening? Are those antibiotics working? No, they're not. Okay? So, I have methicillin-resistant staph aureus. I have to get a different type of antibiotic. I could go in that night for antibiotic, IV antibiotics, the next morning for IV antibiotics, and then the next night. It was like three days in a row. I missed two days at work. It was awful. It went away. It went away. You got like, thank God it worked away, whatever, right? What's the alternative? If it doesn't work, what happens? What happens if that antibiotic doesn't work? That IV antibiotic was what we call the silver bullet of antibiotics. It's the last line of defense against Staph aureus or MRSA. What happens if I don't, if it doesn't work? That happens. They, they would have to take the arm eventually. They would continue to try it with antibiotics and whatever else, but they would have a different mixture of antibiotics, but eventually could end up to amputating. Or I could become septic where the where bacteria gets into the blood and causes lots of problems. All right? So cellulite. And then two years later, happened again the same elbow. But it wasn't, it wasn't MRSA this time. It was just regular, I don't know, Staph aureus. Responded to the first round of antibiotics. And a year after that, it happened on my knee. Same thing. Just like, but, so, but then it just, normal antibiotics, it went away. So I was like, okay, fine. So I've had it three times. My Langerhan cells better kick to do their job. All right, then we get to stratum granulosum, granular layer, right? Superficial to stratum, spi stratum spinosum. This is granular layer. That's where you start to accumulate that keratin. Characterization occurs, the cells die, eventually die, and then um, you become just, essentially the, the cells become cell membranes filled with keratin. And then you get stratum lucidum is your translucent layer, kind of small. Translucent means it's clear, 
under the microscope, you'll see a, a, a separation between. It'll either look like light purple or almost clear, depending upon the staining, you'll see that separation. And again, you'll only see this in thick skin, the palms of the, of the hands and the soles of the feet. It's because the translucent protein, a, a lady, a lady, then, uh, L E I D N. That protein. There we go. This one. Right here. All right. Um, it's an intermediate product in the keratin maturation, so it kind of makes the cell layer look clear. Okay. And then finally, the stratum corneum, the horn like layer. It's what you see when you look at your skin. 20 to 30 layers of dead cells, so it's not but it's not thick. These remember these are can't pancake cells. They are flattened cells, right? They're without a nucleus, tightly packed together and keratinized. Right? Cornified large amount of keratin. Okay? So, the keratinocytes, they start in the stratum basal and they go through the cer certain layers and as they uh, move to the superficial layer, they lose their nucleus. They add more and more keratin, and eventually they are, die off at the top layer, and that happens in a process kind of over two weeks or so, okay? And then they li live on the outside of your skin another two weeks, but every 30 days or so, your skin is turned over, your cells turned over, okay? The idea, the important part, one of the important parts is this is normally unsuitable for microorganism growth, for bacteria. We want that to be there. Save the cells underneath, right? Um, don't let any other uh, bacteria grow or fungus. So this is what it looks like, okay? You're, we've seen this structure to your right. you notice a couple things, okay? Dead keratinocytes, your 20, 30 layers of packed cells, stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, right, the little light layer, and then you get to granulosum, right, the darkened layer is the spot, the granules of keratin, the spiny type cell where you have desmosomes that are attaching them, and then you end up with the basal layer along the dermal papilla. This is your Langerhans, your dendritic cell, right, make sure that nothing gets in here, and then these other ones that are just kind of interspersed around the basal layer, those are melanocytes. Okay, and then you have um, a tactile cell, nervous cell associated with a sensory nerve ending that's present. Here's a sweat gland uh, duct which terminates on the outside of the cell. This is what it looks like under the microscope, right? Sweat gland, you have your granulosum, spinulosum, and then the basal layer underneath with dense irregular connective tissue of the dermis under that. What's this right here then? What's this thing and that? What is that? That's a, one of the dermal papillas, right? So this, see how it, the wave in the dermal papilla kind of extend into parts of the epidermis. You have variations in the epidermis, difference between body regions. We know the thick skin versus thin skin, difference in skin markings as well, and as well as color, right? Thick skin, we know where that is. It has all five layers. You will have sweat glands in thick skin as well but there tend to be no hair follicles or sebaceous glands on the palms of your hand or the, or the soles of your feet, all right? And even though we call it thick skin, it's only still a half, roughly half a millimeter thick. It's not like it's extensively thick, okay? Thin skin covers most of the body. You also, it lacks that fifth layer. You will have sweat glands hair follicles, and sebaceous glands, all right, that are present within the epidermis and into the dermis. All right, so we say thick skin's about half 
a millimeter thick. This thin skin is less than a tenth of a millimeter thick. All right, or right, right around a tenth of a millimeter thick. So about a fifth of the of the size of thick skin. Okay. Here's comparison of thick and thin. Where is the difference? In, in what layer is the difference? We have the stratum lucidum on one side, right? But what's the real difference? The real difference occurs in the stratum corneum, right? That's the biggest difference. Multiple, <coughs> right? We have lots and lots of layers of cornified, keratinized epithelial tissue. And here we only have a few. Right. And here the stratum lucidum is this this darkened kind of layer right right above where the stratum corneum is. Uh, excuse me, right above where the stratum granulosum is. Stratum granulosum, here's stratum lucidum, just right above that. So skin color. It can be normal. Normal color, which you have every day. Why is it normal? It's, it's associated with hemoglobin from your red blood cells that are at the, at the surface of your skin, melanin production, and carotene. Where does carotene come from, and what color is it? Carotene is orange. And it comes from the food you eat. All right, carrots, sweet potatoes have carotene. All right, it's also, well, that, that is supposed to be orange up there. I don't know, on here it is. So, all right, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is an oxygen binding molecule in red blood cells. When it turns, when it's bound to oxygen, it looks like her sweatshirt. It looks kind of like my shirt, okay? Bright red, right? Scarlet red. But when it's not bound to oxygen, it's more of a maroon color, okay? Difference, okay, Be it is because of its, when it's bound to oxygen, it's bright red and you can see it when, uh, when the blood vessels are dilated, you can actually see it in the blood vessels at the layers of the skin, okay? And it's most easily seen in, in fair skin individuals, okay? Lighter the skin, the easier to see, okay? And obviously more visible if blood vessels are dilated. Melanin is the pigment produced and stored by melanocytes. It comes in a couple different shades. It could be black, brown, tan, or yellow, yellowish brown shades. This gives us our different skin tones, normal skin tones. Not only is the, is the shade of melanin different, but it's also the amount in the skin that varies. Okay, so according to heredity and genetics, you could have more or less in different tones, and that gives everyone our kind of different shade of uh, our skin color, okay? We all have the same number of melanocytes, roughly, right? You could have, it's not like one person who has darker skin has more melanocytes than the other person. It's really not, that it is more um, about what type, the type of melanin and the amount of melanin that's produced, the shade of melanin produced and the amount, okay? so. Darker skin individuals produce more and darker colored melanin, okay? And we know skin color ranges from dark to light, okay? And everywhere in between. So here's production of melanocytes. How is it produced? Melanocytes produce the melanin and it gets uh, transferred over to the nearby uh, epidermal cells. And that's where it stays. <coughs> It stays in there as it, as it accumulates, um, it becomes darker, okay? And you can see it actually kind of collects around the nucleus, shading the nucleus from UV light, okay? Questions on melanin? Carotene is a yellow-orange pigment. It's acquired from yellow-orange vegetables. Uh, it accumulates in your subcutaneous fat. So it's not in the epidermal cells, it's actual subcutaneous, okay? And it's converted to vitamin A by the body, 
right? One of the other things that skin does, it helps convert and produce vitamins. The skin helps convert vit carotene to vitamin A and also produces, helps activate and produce vitamin D, okay? You may drink milk every day, right? In cereal, that's vitamin D fortified. That pales in comparison to how much vitamin D you can go out just you know, walking in the sun from the library to class here, right? And in, in short, with some exposed skin. You produce way more uh, vitamin D when you're exposed to sunlight rather than what you consume and absorb from your diet, all right? But carotene plays a role in vision, all right? Especially night vision, all right? So the old tale that your parents said you know, eat your carrots to help your eyes. It's true, it does, right? It does also reduces free radicals. Free radicals are things like uh, oxygen or OH ions. They go around in your body and they run into things. We don't want ions just running into different molecules. We have what's called an antioxidant, they, which help block those free radicals and help your cells live longer. And also carotene has an immune function. Some other problems or differences in skin. One is albinism, right? Albino, that's a lack of skin pigment. This is a inherited genetic, inherited recessive condition. It's genetic, right? So mom and dad are both carriers. There's a possibility that their offspring could display albinism. So in this case, the enzyme for melanin is non-functional, so the body does not produce melanin. So there's no pigment in the skin, there's no pigment in the hair. Um, typically the eyes end up being a light color, um, usually pink, right? although there has been kind of different variations where individuals have maybe a lighter eye color or just not brown. Uh, so, and usually the hair is white or very light blonde, <clears throat> okay? And someone who doesn't produce melanin, what's their problem? What's a problem they could uh, they run into? What's the function of melanin in the body? It protects, protects DNA from the UV light so if they don't have it, they are more susceptible to that, right? Skin damage, what, what happens when you have damaged DNA in melanocytes or in, in the skin in, in general, you end up with uh, higher rates of skin. Okay, so skin color and diagnosis. We said the first thing that skin, the, the visual uh, look of the skin is a good way to kind of tell us what's going on in the body. Here's a couple different ways of looking at that. Someone who's cyanotic or undergoes cyanosis is a blue color in their skin, okay? You've all seen medical shows, Grey's Anatomy or something. Someone who's rescued from drowning but underwater for a while, what happens, what's their skin look like? It's bluish. It's blue not because they've brought, you know, consumed water, they have, but it's blue because the amount of oxygen that's in their blood vessels is reduced and they have bluish skin color. Low oxygenation of hemoglobin leads to that bluish color. That's cyanosis. On the flip side, you could have arrhythmia, you know, erythema, or erythema, right? That is redness, okay? Fever, hypertension, inflammation, allergy, um, exercise, those are all uh, lead to erythema or, or redness of the skin. So someone has flushed cheeks, that's what we're looking at. I talked about fever earlier on. Pallor or blanching is a white, whitening, okay? A loss of blood, a low blood pressure, right? A, a, so you get scared, you go on the Tower of Terror and you get scared, you turn white, that is, you know, from or pallor, or low, or maybe a, a short-term low blood pressure, fear, anger, right, are all <coughs> emotional 
uh, causes of pallor. Jaundice is a yellowing of the skin, right? It's kind of like this yellow color. Uh, your skin kind of looks like the tops of these tables. Um, it is a result of <clears throat> a pro usually a problem with the liver, a liver disorder. Newborns are typically jaundice. You get this uh, yellowish color, yellow to brownish color. And that's because their liver hasn't started working as well yet. And what you have to do is you have to expose them to, to UV light, which helps break down the, the pigment that's causing the jaundice. All right, my daughter was born and we had her at home and she was starting getting a little orange in color. And the doctor was like, well, you we know what to do. We lived in Florida at the time. Go home and put her in front of, put her in the sun. And like she's like two weeks old, but I'm not, you know, she's like, no, put her in front of the window in the sun and it'll, it'll, it'll help work. I'm like, okay, fine. So we have a picture of her all jaundice in her diaper with a pair of sunglasses, my sunglasses on her head, sleeping, and she's in the, like, sitting in the, the, the sliding glass door in the sun. All right, two others, bronzing. Bronzing is inadequate steroid hormones, usually associated with an endocrine disorder called Addison's disease, where you don't break down the melanin correctly. And then bruises. Bruises are also known as hematomas, okay? That's when you break blood vessels, and then that, when you break the blood vessels of the skin, it, underneath, without breaking the skin, blood fills the area. Um, that blood fills the area, the blood vessels uh, clot, and that leftover blood has to, causes the purple color, and then it has to be broken down, and causes that lovely purple, that reddish purple to start to the dark purple to that yellow gross looking purple and then eventually lighter yellow and then back to skin color as it stuff gets moved out okay questions on the skin from today no all right 